All right, welcome everyone and thank you for joining us. We're here for the second installment of our three-part webinar series, which is exploring the scientific policy and economic and community perspectives of the changing Northwest Atlantic Ocean. My name is Shayla Fitzsimmons and I'm Executive Director of CUS Atlantic, which is the Atlantic Regional Association of the Canadian Integrated Ocean Observing System. And hello everyone, I'm Jake Kreitzer. I'm the Executive Director of NERACUS, or the Northeastern Regional Association of Coastal Ocean Observing Systems. We are the Northeastern branch of the U.S. Integrated Ocean System. Uh, a big part of what inspired the series that we are here to continue is the ongoing voyage of the U.S. Coast Guard Cutter Healy. Uh, for those who aren't familiar with Healy, it's the largest and most sophisticated research vessel in the Coast Guard's fleet. And it's in the midst of an historic circumnavigation of the entirety of North America. Uh, two weeks ago in the opening installment in this series, we spoke with Dr. Bob Picard of the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution, who at the time, was serving as chief scientist for Healy's research cruise in Baffin Bay. Uh, and we spoke to him um, while he was at sea in the midst of that cruise, which was pretty cool. So today we're going to look back at Healy's first transit of the Northwest Passage in nearly 20 years uh, and the research that took place along the way uh, in a conversation with Dr. Larry, Larry Mayer of the University of New Hampshire, who was chief scientist for the Northwest Passage Transit. Um, Larry is also the chair of the US National Committee for the UN Decade of Ocean Science, and we'll also get his thoughts on what lies ahead for the decade. Um, I'm particularly interested in hearing from Larry about the decade because we're very excited to announce that this uh, webinar series has recently been endorsed as an official decade event, and so we're very excited about that. We are indeed. Um... Later in the program, after we talk to Larry, we're going to turn our attention a bit further south from the Northwest Passage um, and focus really on the subpolar waters of the Northwest uh, Atlantic, looking outward from Newfoundland and Labrador, across the shelf, the Labrador Sea, um, and beyond, um, and, and as well as some of the connections to the North and South. Um, we're going to hear from two expert panels. Um, they'll provide different insights on this very dynamic and changing region. The first of those panels will focus on a range of scientific issues, while the second will consider a different interrelated community policy and economic perspectives. Uh, before we get to that, we're going to hear a few opening remarks from some government officials from both the US and Canada on the significance of the Northwest Atlantic region and the importance of our interconnected oceans and the diverse issues that we're examining through this series. So the first of those remarks are going to be shared with us by Lyra Carr. Uh, Lyra is the Council General for the U.S. Consulate in Halifax. Um, the U.S. Embassy in Canada has provided funding for this webinar series, and, and we're really grateful for that. Um, and we want to hear from Lyra about some of the perspectives and priorities that motivated that support. Uh, Lyra comes to us with a rather impressive and wide ranging diplomatic resume. She has held posts in, and I don't wanna miss any here, Guatemala, Albania, Afghanistan, Peru, the Dominican Republic, and maybe others I'm missing um, before taking up her current post in Canada. Uh, so thank you for joining us, Lyra. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm pleased for the opportunity to welcome today's participants, and I'd particularly like to thank Jake Kreitzer and everyone at the Naracuz and on board the USCG Healy for the work that they have put into this series of important webinars. The team at the U.S. Consulate General in Halifax, which has a district that includes Newfoundland and Labrador, is proud to have worked with Naracuz as you organize these timely and relevant discussions. President Biden and Prime Minister Trudeau, in their roadmap for a renewed U.S.-Canada partnership, highlighted their vision of a sustainable and inclusive econ economic recovery that strengthens the middle class, creates more opportunities for hardworking people to join it, and ensures good jobs and careers for U.S. citizens and Canadians. As President Biden further said in his Ocean Month proclamation in June, the ocean has always been essential to our economy, and that will remain true as we build back better and develop the clean industries and good jobs of the future. Our engagement in the United Nations Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development reflects the priorities and values of the administration to ensure that ocean science delivers greater benefits for the American people, the people of the world, 
and international ecosystems. In that vein, I really look forward to today's discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much for those remarks, Lyra, and to the embassy for your support uh, in this series. Um, we're now going to hear from Keith Lennon, who is the Director of Ocean Science and Senior Advisor to the Assistant Deputy Minister of Fisheries and Oceans Canada, um, as Canada's national agency responsible for ocean science and policy. Um, Fisheries and Oceans is an important partner of both CEUS, CEUS Atlantic, and NARACRUS, and we're very grateful to Keith for making the time to share his thoughts with us today. Thank you very much, Shayla, for inviting me to this meeting, and thank you as well, Jake. I'm very happy to have the opportunity to chat with you here. Uh, my name is Keith Lennon, as, as uh, Shayla was mentioning, I'm the Director of the Ocean and Climate Change Science Program at Fisheries and Oceans, and the federal lead for establishing Canada's Integrated Ocean Observation System. And before I get into my opening remarks, I'd just like to give a little plug for CEUS and um, indicate that, you know, CEUS is our... Um, serves as Canada's nucleus for ocean observations in support of a sustainable future and a healthy ocean. I'm very honored to be in partnership, working in partnership with our three regional associations, the Atlantic, Pacific, and the St. Lawrence, to form one national network aimed at sharing ocean observations, knowledge, and data. As well, I'd be very remiss if I didn't acknowledge the other supporting partners in Neo, NEOPAR and Hakai Institute. So it's interesting, the conversation that we're going to be having today, and I'm looking forward to it. And when I looked at the overall um, request for my speaking notes who was saying talking about how you know the importance of the interconnected oceans from a government perspective and I come from very much a, uh, a science administration role as well as a program delivery role and so the complex the complexity of that question um, wasn't lost on me I mean when I looked at this type of uh, discussion I was thinking do I talk about the inter interconnected oceans from a natural environment or ecosystem perspective do we look at the physical properties? Do we talk about our, our interconnectedness to the oceans from a perspective of who we are as a people? And I've decided to take a different path. Um, what I'm gonna be speaking to very briefly is that if we all know that the oceans and our living resources are interconnected, why do we insist on looking at the challenges, opportunities uh, facing our oceans from a myopic and stovepipe perspective? And what I'd like to do is challenge you folks um, as we move forward with the, the voyage of the Healy to take that into perspective and try to come up with a different approach. A prime example is climate change. Climate change is making our, our global oceans warmer, more acidic, and retaining less oxygen. These changes are, all, are causing our living marine resources to shift their home ranges in search of more suitable um, conditions or in search of prey. Just look at the examples of the Atlantic lobster or the North Atlantic right whale. Climate change is also impacting our economy. Many local fishermen can no longer harvest fish from their traditional grounds so they venture further from port. However, we also know that their severity and frequency of storm surges is increasing and it's putting these folks at uh, in dangerous peril. So we, traditionally we look at uh, addressing the actual impact of, of climate change versus looking at the root causes. We adjust our management regimes. We, we set up aerial subvert, uh, surveillance when it comes um, with regards to uh, when whales are in danger, danger entanglement. We increase our search and rescue efforts to save lives of mariners. Don't get me wrong, these are very important and necessary, but we as a community need to change our perspective and be more proactive and, and reactive. I guess it's human nature as creatures, of, uh, as creatures, we compartmentalize, dissect, and address threats and problems in the order of immediate importance. It's a survival instinct. We have to put that in, instinct aside and look more from the uh, proactive perspective. Let's face it, the ocean observation community rarely faces the pointy end of the stick when it comes to pressures facing high-level decision makers. Um, never in my 27 years in the Canadian government in the administration of environmental programs have I seen angry stakeholders hold the minister to account because the bottom temperature off the nose of the Grand Banks has risen by 4.4 degrees. That being said, we know the importance and the impact of that. If we are to be truly successful, and I challenge you as we move forward, we need to change the way we um, change the way we do our business and adapt our conduct when it comes to research and monitoring. The circumpolar navigation, sorry, the circumnavigation of North America by the Healy is one prime example where we can work to be more connected between nations, between disciplines, and between, between communities. Um, governments need to, we need to adopt, uh, adapt the way we think, the, need, the way we need to um, develop programs and deliver policies, establish our regulations, etc. However, before we can adapt, we must understand, and before we can understand, we must observe, and that is our challenge as we move forward today. So I'm asking you as we move forward today in this conversation to take a different perspective, look to see how we can actually work more in tune with one another and bring in perspectives from different, um, 
different um, scientific domains and disciplines. I believe that through um, the activities between CEUs, NERACUS, and the scientific community, we can start to commit to work together um, to develop oceanographic observations, information, and data that is going to be able to be used for multiple different societal needs versus just a, a single myopic approach. We can help to establish um, standards and protocols. We can establish uh, common indicators for reporting and tracking so there's consistency between nations. We can build, build common data assembly centers and common tools that convert key data in, to information. We can contribute to the global community. And I believe, so in conclusion, as we move forward, I'd like to challenge you folks to really take a look at how we do our business and advance the co concept in, of interconnected oceans from a science perspective. We start with ourselves, we build trust, we lead by example, and we keep improving. Thank you very much. Keith, thank you for those remarks. I, uh, I think what you just said really hits at the, the underlying philosophy, I think, of this webinar series, which is really about scale and complexity and, and connections. And, and I think that was all right on point. So thank you. Um, now it's my pleasure to uh, introduce uh, Carl Goldman. Uh, Carl is um, the Director of the Integrated Ocean Observing or uh, System or IUS office within NOAA's National Ocean Service. Uh, now, NIRACUS, as I mentioned earlier, is part of the National IUS enterprise that Carl and his team oversee. So he's an incredibly important partner um, in our work and we're grateful that he's here. Uh, Carl has held a number of positions within IUS over the years. I, I had to introduce Carl um, in another event and wasn't really sure what from his resume to include. So I think I just boiled it down as I will now to say he's probably held about as many positions within IUS as anyone, uh, culminating in his directorship. So there's really few people I think that are better suited to speak to um, the issues we're tackling in this series. And, and I thank Carl for joining us. Yeah, thank you, Jake. Thank you, Shayla, and other panelists uh, and, the, and the embassy for putting this uh, series of events together. And so I'm I'm happy really to follow my previous two speakers. Uh, Keith and I have worked together for a while, and I'm really happy to see CUs in Canada being established. They set it up with a regional to national framework, a federated system, sort of like we did in the U.S., and it's been great working together and seeing NIRACUS and Atlantic CUs work together in this context is wonderful. Um, a little, well, a few other roles and hats that I wear. I'm the, the U.S. representative to the GUS, the Global Ocean Observing System Regional Alliance. Uh, I'm also on the planning team for the UN Decade uh, of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development in the Predicted Ocean um, category. And one of the last two trips I was able to take before the pandemic hit was to come to Canada for the North Atlantic Workshop uh, on a predicted ocean that, that was held in Halifax um, back in January of 2020. And so um, it's great to be in this venue and talking with you all again. I think, you know, within, within the US, there's a great amount of attention and understanding right now about ocean data information and ocean information services and how critical ocean-related information services are to weather prediction, commerce and safety at sea, navigation, um, hazards predictions like storm surge, harmful algal blooms, fisheries services, ecosystem services. So there is a whole host of societal benefits that we all understand are related to understanding and having data and information, and specifically decision support and information services from the data and information. And so in that regard, the new head of NOAA, Dr. Rick Spinrad, he's been at NOAA before in multiple roles, and he's a co-editor of, of a book on the new blue economy. And I wanted to briefly touch on the new blue economy to him, I believe, and to me, is the information age economy. And that's that decision support information services from ocean data and predictions that help us decide when and if and how to get in and out of port safely, decide how to move our shipping containers efficiently in and out of ports, which is a challenge right now with supply chain issues, um, that help us manage fisheries, that help us manage our day-to-day -day choices on whether we're gonna go to the beach or not, whether we're gonna harvest food from the ocean or not, et cetera, et cetera. And so as a reminder, the marine economy is valued at approximately 2 trillion annually, projected to grow to greater than 3 trillion 
by 2030. And this idea of having a new digital ocean, a new blue economy, um, is going to rely on Earth system prediction capabilities as well. And it's the people, the information technology, and the data management and modeling capabilities together that are going to provide the solutions that we need. And so having a forum like this where we're talking together about a specific, specific geographies, specific science and observing technologies, and how to deliver information, products, and services to meet societal needs. And so I could go on and on, and I'm going to stop and just say I'm happy to be here among the panelists, and I look forward to our discussions today and to the this this, this webinar series continuing on into next month. Um, so with that, Jake, I will stop and hand it off. Thank you, Carl. I, I appreciate those remarks, and 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 I think like um, like both Lyros and Keats, I think they really get at the underlying. Um, you know the under the underlying philosophy of what we're tackling here which is really the scale and complexity of, of what we're all facing in a changing ocean so thank you um before we turn our attention to the water stretching out from newfoundland and labrador we're actually going to backtrack a little bit and look back at the healy's transit through the northwest passage and the research that took place there um, Larry Mayer will speak to us about that. He's a professor in the School of Marine Science and Ocean Engineering at the University of New Hampshire and director of the Center for Coastal and Ocean Mapping. As chief scientist for Healy's Northwest Passage Voyage, we're really looking forward to hearing from him about what the science team did and what they saw during the expedition. Larry, take it away. Thank you very much, Shayla, and thank you, uh, Jake, for the invitation. Um, I guess I'm going to start by explaining what our science was on board the ship. Those of us from the University of New Hampshire, we were a large group, about six of us, maybe maybe even more with some, some add-ons. And, and we were out there basically to, to map the seafloor. And that has to do with the fact that there has been, and Emily, if you can just click the slide, a remarkable change in our ability to map the seafloor over the last 20 or 30 years. Uh, we've gone from a very, very blurry view of the ocean through the techniques that were available up to about uh, 20, 30 years ago to a, a remarkable ability to really resolve what the seafloor looks like uh, through something called multi-beam sonar. Uh, and the next slide, please, Emily. And, and the, the issue is, though, that despite lots of efforts, at this point in time, only about 20% of the seafloor has been mapped in this way. And so for 80% of the seafloor, we really have very little idea what's there. And I, and I always ask the question, how can we manage and how can we protect what we don't know and we don't understand? And this uh, theme has been picked up by uh, an international effort called uh, Seabed 2030. It's funded in part by the Nippon Foundation and collaboration with GEPCO, the organization responsible for producing global charts of the ocean. Um, and it has a very aspirational goal of seeing the the whole world's ocean mapped by the year 2030. It's really, really a, a difficult challenge, but we're putting our best effort into it. And when the Coast Guard announced that the Healy was going to be transiting from Alaska to uh, Greenland, they put out a query and they said, what, what science could be done during this transit that didn't involve major stopping of the ship? Because really this was a, what they call a science accommodation cruise, a cruise the that, that's really organized by the Coast Guard to get the ship from one place to another, but they can accommodate science as long as it didn't really interfere. And uh, we jumped in, next slide please, and said because the Healy has one of these uh, wonderful multi-beam sonars, uh, we would love to take advantage of this transit through an area that's very uh, poorly mapped um, and we'll be in the coming years probably seeing much, much more traffic um, we would love to be able to map where we can, collect new data, add to Seabed 2030, and work with our Canadian colleagues in the Canadian Hydrographic Service to try to see if we can pick up areas of high priority to them. And so uh, we set off uh, to do that. Next slide, please. And uh, if you can see, if you can see that gray line, that's kind of the, the track that the Healy uh, crew set down, which would have been the shortest route to come from uh, Seward, Alaska, where we uh, left uh, heading up uh, 
into uh, the Bering Sea and eventually through the Northwest Passage. But what we asked is if we could just slightly modify the course, you see the yellow track there, to start picking up these gaps uh, in, in ocean mapping data and really making a contribution to, the, to this effort. Next slide, please. And so they were very amenable and very agreeable to allow us to do that. And so we were able to uh, do that our entire route from uh, Seward all the way to Nuuk, Greenland, always uh, collecting data as best we could where there were gaps, uh, and there are many gaps up there. Um, next slide, please. We weren't the only group on board that was uh, collecting uh, information underway in, in, in this uh, mode where we don't stop the ship. We had a team from the National Geospatial uh, Intelligence Agency who was testing new gravimeters and instruments that measure uh, the gravitational uh, attraction of the Earth and connecting east and west as they went through the Northwest Passage. We had uh, Laura Jaranek from uh, Oregon State University uh, doing underway water sampling for oxygen and nitrogen and argon isotopes to look at a proxy for productivity measurements and looking how productivity changed throughout. Uh, and she had a co another colleague from uh, Oregon State, uh, Miguel Goni, who um, was doing more old fashioned in a sense, but absolutely critical ground truthing of her productivity proxies by sampling and filtering the, the water that came through. Um, Laura was able to make about 10 million measurements uh, through the course of the passage. Miguel, about 500 actual you know, individual samples, uh, but very, very critical. And another group from uh, University of Alaska um, that uh, was measuring another set of isotopes to look at uh, water and air changes in the in, at both the water and the air and changes in the carbon cycle. And again, the ability to make about 10 million uh, measurements underway through these automatic uh, sampling machines, just really fantastic. And we also had a, a young fellow, uh, Andy Margolin, who calls himself Arctic Andy, who was running an outreach uh, program. And so we had many programs, but none of them interfering with the with the trip. Next slide, please. So uh, again, you see us uh, starting out, you can barely see the little bathymetry in shallow water. It's so thin and up in the Canada Basin where the water gets deeper, the, the, uh, the area that we mapped got much wider. And you can see this Banks Island, uh, and that Banks Island is uh, one of the first uh, entrances into the Northwest Passage. The Healy actually wanted to go north of Banks Island, uh, the kind of a straight shot. Uh, north of, of Banks Island, but next slide. We actually had a very, very heavy ice season here, and you can see here's Banks Island on the right, and you can see the blue line indicating where the Healy wanted to go, but that was very heavy ice, and so they had to go a southern route south of Banks Island and up through uh, something called Prince of Wales uh, Strait, uh, the yellow line, where, which was ice-free at that time, which was actually nice for us. Next slide, because that brought us in a, a, ver a very narrow channel. Um, it at the ice edge, we got to uh, witness uh, some wonderful wildlife in terms of uh, walruses here, and you'll see some beautiful photos taken by John Farrell, who'll be on a panel a little later, um, both a, a wonderful participant in the cruise and a great photographer. Next slide, please. Um, when we got into the thicker ice, of course, a number of, uh, of uh, um, interactions uh, from afar um, with polar bears. Next slide, please. As I said, we were able to head up Prince William's uh, Prince of Wales Strait. Um, it was uh, ice-free, and it also gave us the opportunity for the first time to really see the spectacular uh, countryside around. Next slide, please. Uh, right in the middle of the strait is a, a, a beautiful set of islands called uh, Prince Royal Island. There are actually several of them, Prince Royal Islands, uh, that gave us some 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 spectacular views of the local geology. Once we came out of the strait, though, uh, next slide, we went. Um, back into uh, what's called uh, Viscount Melville Sound, the large open area. You can see the mapping track we took, but we also uh, again ran into some heavy ice. Next slide. Yep, next slide. Thank you. Um, as we had a rendezvous with the Canadian vessel uh, Amundsen and the uh, Commandant of the Coast Guard and the uh, Commissioner of the uh, Canadian Coast Guard came to visit us on the ship out of Resolute. Um, but we were in some very, very heavy ice up, up there. Uh, next slide, just to give you an indication of what that ice looks like out the window. Uh, this is a, another nice shot from John in the evening. But what we were able to do um, is to run an ice survey. We, we got there enough time to run a good survey for the Canadian Hydrographic Service, opening up a new uh, route for them that now we can verify is safe for, for, for navigation. Uh, next slide, please. 
coming out of Resolute, um, we got to go by Devon Island and see the, the beautiful uh, marine terminating glaciers from there um, and a series of stops uh, for some XCTD stations were actually for uh, for Bob for the next leg. We uh, did that in, in support of his leg. Next slide, please. Uh, again, one of one of the marine terminating glaciers off Devon Island and some beautiful icebergs that we started to encounter once we got um, to the uh, eastern side of the the uh, Northwest Passage. Next slide, please. And again, it's just uh, just spectacular, uh, spectacular scenery and beautiful photos by John. Final slide. Um, the XCTD stations that we took for Bob Picard and some detailed mapping we then did um, because we arrived in enough time to give us some opportunity to, to stop for a little while for the Greenland um, Institute of Natural Resources and we coordinated with them. So we were able to do mapping for our Canadian colleagues all the way through the Northwest Passage, but a special a transit route for the hydrographic service and uh, a special mapping uh, area for the uh, Greenland uh, Institute of Natural Resources. And then finally, coming in uh, the last few days, we actually had some clear weather and some beautiful northern lights. And last slide, coming into into Nuuk, Nuuk Greenland. One more slide, just to show beautiful Nuuk, which was a, a wonderful spot. And so that kind of captured the, the cruise. I, I think it was one of these wonderful opportunities to do stuff that was very, very helpful to uh, the Canadian, our Canadian colleagues for the hydrographic service, uh, helpful to our uh, Greenland colleagues through the Institute of Natural Resources there, and certainly helpful for our global ambition to uh, add to our effort to see the entire seafloor map by 2030, and at the same time make all these critically important measurements of productivity um, and isotopes to look at atmospheric uh, and uh, and water changes. Um, and so that, I think, hopefully sums up uh, the trip. Um, we'll be uh, making those data all available to uh, both our international colleagues and, and the global community as soon as, as soon as we can. Wow, Larry, thank you. That was pretty spectacular. Um, I, um, I have a, a couple questions I want to put to you, if you don't mind. I mean, you, um, you know, for those who don't know, um, Larry also serves as the U.S. National Committee Chair for the U.N. Ocean Decade. So uh, I certainly want to take advantage of him being here to get his perspective um, with that hat on. But first, um, um, just given what you just shared with us, I, I had a couple of questions I was hoping to put to you. You, um, you mentioned a few times that the, the ice cover was heavier than you were expecting. Um, do you have any idea why? I mean, I think the, yeah, the general message we we all hear these days is that you know ice cover is thinning and receding, and so it's uh, you know I know there's of course year to year anomalies and long term trends, but do you know anything about the conditions this year that that had you steaming into thicker ice than you expected? Yeah, I don't I don't know explicitly about the atmospheric conditions that led to this. Uh, it's often associated with wind directions and things like that. But I think you you hit the nail on the head. I mean, I've been going to the Arctic now for well, since 2003. I've had about 15 15 separate cruises to different uh, parts of the Arctic, and uh, certainly have firsthand witnessed this amazing uh, decrease in sea ice that we've seen over the years. But that decrease is, is a trend. Um, and superimpose on that are annual variations. And it's just like the difference between uh, weather and climate. You know, my mom's always saying, how can I say it's global warming? It's cold out today. Well, that, that's today's weather. It's the long-term trend that, that, that we're seeing in terms of global warming. And it's the same with uh, the decrease in the ice, that there's an unquestionable ten, uh, trend of about 13% decline per decade in the sea ice, in, in, in the, uh, in the um, minimum extent of the sea ice. Um, but superimpose on that are annual variations. And uh, last year was, uh, I think, the second uh, lowest um, extent, and this year was uh, somewhat higher. But I'm, I have no doubt that we're still on that general trend of decrease. Thanks, Larry. I'm, I'm, I'm also interested just in the, um, you know, you, you touched briefly upon the breadth of research that took place during the transits um and i have to say it seems pretty it, 
it seems like a pretty wide range of work that the team was able to accomplish, especially working under the constraint of, you know, the, the ship's going to keep moving. Um, as chief scientist, you know, what, what was involved on your end in, in assembling that team and selecting which research, you know, to, to conduct um, during this, this really unique opportunity? Yeah, well, here, here's where I have to make a, a, a harsh admission that in the case of a science accommodation cruise, uh, I was asked to be chief scientist, but it was the Coast Guard that selected the, the programs that went along, uh, which is unusual. It would be unusual. Certainly in a, in a normal cruise where we're paying for the science, the chief scientist would be making those decisions. But I think they did a wonderful job, and you're right. There was a great breadth. And I think what we're benefiting so is uh, from uh, just remarkable technology that lets us make these kinds of measurements, 10 million isotopic measurements while the ship is underway. That, that is just remarkable. Every five seconds, it's making another analysis. And it's something we're talking about for the future, that, that future, future uh, icebreakers, the, the, the new icebreakers as they come along, should be equipped with this suite of underway equipment, including the mapping that we can also now, with high bandwidth communication, control remotely, uh, so that we should be making these kinds of measurements all the time. Thanks, Larry. We um, we need to move on in a few minutes to our first panel discussion. But um, you know, as I said, having you here um, would seem a wasted opportunity to not ask you to put on your hat as UN, uh, sorry, U.S. National Committee Chair for the Ocean Decade. Um, and and my question is really very open ended. Is it just you know from that position, what do you see lying ahead? You know, perhaps as it relates to what we're trying to do through this webinar series or your experience through the Northwest Passage. But, um, you know, what does the decade have in store for us? Yeah, so the decade is, to me, just a, a remarkable opportunity. It's a recognition globally at the highest levels of government of the critical role that the ocean pay, plays in, in our future. Um, it's as simple as that. And, all, you know, all the things that the, the introductory speakers mentioned, the, 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 the having the decade recognized it is is just a global acceptance of, of that set of facts and it, it becomes an opportunity then um, from a u.s perspective uh, the u.s national committee put out a call for what we called ocean shots audacious proposals and, and we got a remarkable response uh, we've had two calls now we have over 140 um, applications the committee has now finally uh, been authorized just this last week um, because it's a National Academy Committee, there are many constraints, but we're finally now authorized to try to aggregate these and put them into a, a three, three to five cross-cutting uh, themes that are going to involve many of those ocean shot concepts and present those to our funding agencies, to something called the SOST, um, that rep is representative of the, the funding agencies that support ocean science. And hopefully we will get initiatives funded that will really allow the community to work together and work collaboratively, um, looking at a, at a much larger scale of problem that we've been able to do in the past. So I think that's the huge advantage, and and organizations like yours are just key to that kind of uh, interaction, and and seminars <clears throat> like this, a webinar series like this, uh, a way to distribute that message. Thank you so much, Larry. We're right on time. Um, so we are going to have to, unfortunately. Yeah, yes, I'll, I'll say that too. I wasn't, wasn't sure we were going to get there, but I'm, I'm, I'm <laughs> glad we, we managed. <laughs> uh, but what a fascinating presentation and so interesting to hear about all the science that's being done in the Arctic and the potential for that Thank to you very continue much. in the future. Uh, we are going to turn now to our science panel. So we're going to hear a series of short lightning talks from our panelists after which Jake and I will moderate a panel discussion. We will try to take a few questions from the audience as time allows, so please do feel free to send those in through the questions tab at any point uh, during the presentations or during the panel discussion. Our first panelist is Jamie Palter, who is an Associate Professor of Oceanography from the University of Rhode Island. Dr. Palter's lab studies physical and biogeochemical processes from the North Atlantic to tropical, water, tropical waters. So she's uniquely positioned to really provide us with the oceanographic context for today's discussion. Jamie. 
Thank, thanks. Thanks for the introduction and for the invitation um, and for letting me just kind of pick a science topic that I've been, you know, working on for a long time in the, in the Northeast. I didn't know um, that I had something to do with the Healy until I realized that Bob Picard actually picked up some samples for us um, during his cruise that, that you were just talking about. So, so we're all interconnected in, in oceanography. Um, so I want to talk about abrupt circulation changes um, on the Labrador Scotian and Northeast US shelf. And so we'll just go to the next slide. Um, this is really work that started um, while I was at McGill with Mariona Claret and then was continued by my wonderful graduate student, Afonso Gonsalves, who published in 2021 um, a paper explaining the mechanisms that have caused the really rapid warming of the Scotian shelf all the way to the beyond the Gulf of Maine. Um, which is some of the fastest warming waters in the world and, and probably some of the reasons that people um, are concerned maybe that, that tuned in today. Um, this is a figure of the average temperature following a statistical change point so that a st uh, objective way of assessing a, a kind of regime shift on the shelf that happened between 2009 and 2011. Um, so the average temperature at 150 meters minus the, the temperature before that period. And you can see temperature changes of up to up to and above two degrees Celsius at that depth. Um, so next slide. Um, Afonso's work went into how we can understand the mechanisms that cause that change. Um, and I wish I could show you all the great figures he put together, but I think this animation um, possibly gives the best um, visual intuition to, to what we think is happening. And so this is from a GFDL model CM 2.6, so it's one tenth degree model that was, and it was a uh, animation made by Mariona Claret in, in her 2018 paper. And you'd think that we dyed the Labrador seawaters red, but really this is a plot of the oxygen concentration on an isopycnal. The water masses coming from the Labrador Sea are well oxygenated, they're also cool and fresh. Um, and the water masses from the Gulf Stream are have low oxygen on this isopycnal and are warm and salty. And if you look at the pre-industrial control run on the left, that's with no climate-related perturbation, you can see that there's this really robust connectivity of that Labrador current waters around the tail of the Grand Banks. And so I asked Emily if she could maybe point to that tail there. Yes, yeah, so you can see the red colors, that high oxygenated waters, rounding the tail of the Grand Banks and bringing oxygen all along the slope. But in the climate change run, where uh, atmospheric CO2 is doubled at a rate of 1% per year, that Labrador current connectivity just gets totally choked off. So the slope is flooded with the low oxygen waters of the Gulf Stream. And so between Mariona's work and, and Afonso's work, we showed um, the mechanism that this happens. We offer up to a year of predictability for anomalies on the slope and shelf um, through monitoring this at sea surface height. Uh, and and um, try help explain why we've seen such rapid warming warming in this region we care about. So next slide, please. Um, one thing that has become kind of prevalent in the literature is that people think that these changes are proxies for the Atlantic meridional overturning circulation. So this figure is from Cesar et al. in 2018, and she used the same uh, model, this GFDL CM 2.6 model. Um, and it's very strong correlation with between warming in those in this shelf region and the AMOC in that model to argue that um, we can use that warming region as a proxy for AMOC decline. So that's some evidence in favor of it. Another one is that this 2008 abrupt shift was also um, coincided with a 2008 decline in the AMOC as observed directly at 26 north from the rapid array. So those are our two pieces of evidence in favor. But there are alternative uh, hypotheses, including one from Janis Kolling this year, a colleague of mine, um, who uh, said that perhaps AMOC shifts to interior pathways. So even though the Labrador current gets choked off at the tail of the Grand Banks, perhaps the AMOC stays robustly um, strong by shifting the deep limb to these interior pathways. So next slide, almost done. Um, so in the big picture here is that regardless of the AMOC status, the shelf is clearly responding to a circulation change that we trace to the tail of the Grand Banks and can be anticipated with up to a year, up to and beyond a year of lead time by monitoring sea surface height at the tail of the Grand Banks. Um, and that the warming and decreasing oxygen on the shelf is known to stress benthic organisms and has been linked to changes in fish phenology, which we may hear about next. 
if the AMOC connection is robust, and I think that still remains to be seen, then the circulation disruption has even more far-reaching implications because of the AMOC's role in transporting CO2 to the deep ocean at heat to high latitudes. And so with that, I'll conclude and just a shameless plug, I am recruiting a postdoc at this time for the early career people on the line to get in touch with me if you're interested. Thank you. Thanks, Jamie. I will be delighted if I eventually learn that your new postdoc came about because someone learned of the opportunity through this series. So uh, fingers crossed you find someone. Uh, but no, thank you. Thank you um, for those um, insights. And I, and I think you really, you really hit it sort of the large scale processes and, and, and kind of interconnections that we're hoping to underscore here. So uh, thank you. And we'll, we'll bring you back in a few moments for our panel discussion. But uh, next up, I want to introduce um, Maxime Geoffroy, uh, who is a research scientist at the Fisheries and Marine Institute of Memorial University. Um, he has expertise spanning fisheries acoustics, marine ecology, and biological oceanography, um, and he applies those expertise uh, to research that better aims to understand the ecology of the North Atlantic and Arctic pelagic ecosystems as they relate to hydrography and climate change. Uh, so Maxime, please. Thank you, Jake, and thank you for the uh, invitation. So uh, I'm not directly related to the uh, the research being conducted on the heli, but uh, as um, Larry mentioned, there's also a Canadian icebreaker that is uh, present in the Arctic uh, actually every year since 2003, which is called the Amundsen. And part of the research we were doing is really conducted from that boat. And of course, these are collaboration with colleagues from also from the US and uh, Greenland. So we have a uh, strong connection with all uh, Arctic and subarctic researchers. So my really brief overview about the pelagic ecosystem of the uh, Labrador Sea and, and towards the Arctic, so really the subpolar North Atlantic, um, just a quick introduction of the main species that are there and what are the current state of knowledge uh, for that uh, component of that the region. Next slide, please. So the subpolar North Atlantic is really a zone of transition. So where you really go from the Atlantic ecosystem towards the Arctic ecosystem in Baffin Bay. Uh, and one of the most striking uh, differences between these two uh, ecosystems, at least in terms of pelagic, is really the uh, reduction in that biodiversity. So you have more species, more redundancy at each trophic level when you are in the Atlantic than when you are in the You uh, have the same kind of processes applying the same kind of have the same kind of inborn of trophic chain. So where you start with the sun providing the energy for primary production that is being grazed on by um, secondary production. So mainly uh, in case of North Atlantic and the Arctic, mainly copepods, which are really abundant zooplankton. And those are being fed, uh, they are preyed on by uh, their predators, which are pelagic fish, small fish living in the water column. Often we call them forage fish because they are uh, really providing most of the energy to higher trophic level. They are being preyed on intensively by seabirds but also by larger piscivorous fish that are exploited by many of the fisheries in the region and in turn these piscivorous fishes are being eaten by larger uh, pelagic fish or uh, bigger uh, demersal fish um, so just to compare put that in terms of numbers so in the in the atlantic you have 318 fish species uh, including 137 that are endemic if you compare that to the arctic you have uh, almost 100 less species only 229 marine fish species and of which only 48 are considered to be Arctic or mainly Arctic. Uh, of those 229 species, uh, it's worth noting that there's 221 that are uh, present in the Canadian Arctic. So we, in our um, in our backyard, we mostly have, we have almost all fish species that exist in the Arctic. Uh, and also, so it's not just for the fish, but the marine mammal uh, diversity is also lower in the in the Arctic. We have 35 marine mammal species uh, in the in the Arctic versus 48. In the uh, in the Atlantic, and there, although the uh, there's 229 marine fish species uh, that have been recorded in the Arctic, it's worth noting that most of them live close to the bottom. Uh, there are really few that are purely pelagic and that spend their whole lifetime in the water column. Uh, next slide, please. So in terms of trends and changes occurring in the pelagic ecosystem of the subpolar region, one of the most striking one that has cascading impacts on the whole tropic system is a trend towards smaller zooplankton species. So these regions have high productivity, but in a very short period of time. So you really need to capitalize on that 
and really store that energy. And that's what these abundant copper pods do. If you look at the species on the top uh, pictures, you have Calanus hyperboreus, Calanus glacialis, and Calanus fumarchicus, which are abundant species in the subpolar and, and polar regions. And what you see in the middle are lipid sacs. So you have that's where they store the lipids. They are very, very fat, and then they are like a big steak for their craving pelagic fish. Uh, and those are being more and more replaced by smaller species, uh, for instance, Oinclina similis or Pseudocalanus species. Um, all these species are still there. They, they still they were there for uh, for a really long time. They have been co-occurring, but really the trend is are less of the former and more of the later. So you were really switching from big stakes that are floating around to small popcorn pieces, uh, which we can still, uh, if you're a pelagic fish, you can still feed on, but you will have not as much energy out of uh, them. Next slide, please. So which species, uh, which, which species do we consider pelagic or small pelagic, or often, if you, you heard that term, forage fish species? Well, if you are in the, the North Atlantic, the most species you have are um, the, the most abundant, or herring for the southern part, then as you go further north, we'll have more capelin, and sandlands is another one. So not that many species, but still you have redundancy. You have three main species. The more you go north, you have almost exclusive Arctic cod, that is on the top uh, right picture, and also a little bit of ice cod. Although they are called cod, they are more similar in size to capelin and herring. They are small forage fish, and they are they rarely reach uh, or reach sizes longer than 20 centimeters. And these are very abundant in the north. So as you go from the, the Great Banks towards the Arctic, you have this overlap between all these Arctic and subarctic species, but the ratio changes. So as you go from the Grand Banks, you have way more capelin, some herring, a lot of sandlands. And as you go further north, and, and a little bit of uh, Arctic cod, a nice cod, but as you go further north, you have way more Arctic cod, and Arctic cod is usually more abundant than the, the ice cod, and way less capelin and herring. So that changes in relative abundance is, is an important uh, component of the, uh, of the latitudinal gradient when you go from one region, from Labrador Sea, for instance, to Baffin Bay. Uh, and just one thing that um, Jamie mentioned about the uh, changes in the phenology of the fish, it's not just the phenology that is changing with, the, uh, with climate change, but also the relative abundance. Uh, what, one thing that has been uh, demonstrated and observed in several uh, instances is that capelin is now, uh, and sandlands are now more abundant in the Arctic, and that could uh, reduce the importance of Arctic cod. There will be a switch in the main species funneling the energy between zooplankton to higher trophic level as uh, glomal warming. Next slide. Did you? Oh, yeah. So, and one thing that you may know or may not know is that one of the really abundant species of the Labrador Sea and of the Grand Banks is not very uh, known. It's the glacier lantern fish, or Bentosema glaciale. Uh, this is part of the species lantern fish of this group of species that have more than 200 uh, of them that are uh, very, very abundant in the world's ocean. Actually, there are studies, several studies uh, suggesting they might be the most abundant stock of fish in the whole, on the whole planet. Um, but surprisingly, we don't hear much about them. Uh, one of the reasons being because they are mainly offshore. So as you go from the slow and the deeper basins, you start seeing when you have echograms or acoustics, which is what you have on the left, uh, when you have this layer of blue and green, these are layer of fish, and in that case, between 200 and 1,000 meters. And these are mesopelagic fish, and they are very, very abundant. And they are also very abundant in the uh, Labrador Sea. So when we put nets offshore, that's the main species we're going to get. Small fish, about four to five centimeters, have photophores produce uh, bioluminescence. Um, and then, but the one thing that is striking is that you go further north when you, uh, if you cross the uh, Davis Strait, so next slide, please. As you cross Davis Strait, which is the black line uh, on the map here, going from Labrador Sea to Baffin Bay, really uh, it's striking, you start, at, you stop having that mesopelagic layer, or at least it's way more faded, and then you change your, uh, your abundance of Mictophids, which are the lantern fish, to more Arctic cod. So really, you have a, some disappearance of that species as you go further north. And we're really trying to understand what are the main drivers of that change in the ecosystem. 
Uh, one of them could be the light regimes. As you know, as you go in the Arctic, you will have the midnight sun and the polar night. So one hypothesis is that they cannot feed during daytime because they, uh, during the midnight sun because they cannot go and feed at the surface uh, during nighttime because there's no nighttime. And it could also, be, could also be related to cold temperature near the surface, preventing them to surviving in the Baffin Bay. So that's, that, these are the questions we're now tackling. And we think that it's a mix of both factors, probably. Next slide. So just take home messages, uh, summarize briefly. Uh, there are more pelagic biodiversity in subarctic regions than in the Arctic. However, because of uh, ongoing ecosystem change and climate change, the uh, productivity in the uh, in, in, in at least on our Canadian side of the Atlantic is uh, getting lower, but and the species are migrating or extending their range uh, further north uh, into the Arctic, which could result in what is, is called a borealization of uh, the Arctic ecosystem. However, it's important to note that this we will not have an Arctic that is exactly as uh, in a few decades exactly as it is now the uh, the Scotland Shelf, for instance. A reason for that is that some of the extreme conditions prevailing at the Arctic would still prevail. And one of them is being the extreme light regime. We will still have polar night and midnight sun, even though we have climate change in the Arctic. And not all organisms and fish and, and zooplankton can adapt to that. And another one is that although the, uh, there's a trend toward lower ice concentration and ice extent in the Arctic and warmer temperatures, the reality is that the uh, surface temperature in the winter will continue to be uh, quite cold. And it's not all species from the North Atlantic that would be able to uh, adapt to that. So. Both ecosystems are in, uh, in a state of change, but uh, what exactly lies in front of us is really not uh, clear. Uh, and then we, uh, we might have some surprises as we as these, these, um, these climate change on, on the earth. Thank you. All right, thank you so much, Maxime, for that incredibly interesting talk. And I think there's a lot of uh, knock-on effects, I think, that we can expect to see from these shifts that are happening and that we need to, of course, observe and understand so that we can put in policies in place that help conserve our, our valuable and uh, delicate ecosystems in our oceans. Uh, I'd just like to remind all of our attendees that you can uh, submit questions through the question tab at any time, any time during the uh, presentations themselves or even during the panel presentation. Um, the final speaker on our science panel is Jamie Tam, who is a research biologist at the Bedford Institute of Oceanography and is the Canadian co-chair of the ICES Working Group for the Northwest Atlantic Regional Sea. Previously, Jamie has worked uh, as a marine scientist for the New Zealand Department of Conservation in Wellington, New Zealand, and NOAA Fisheries as a postdoctoral post fellow in Woods Hole, Massachusetts. Her research focuses on ecological modeling and ecosystem-based management. Jamie. Hello, and uh, thanks for the kind introduction. Uh, I just want to start off uh, by respectfully acknowledging that I'm joining this meeting from Mi'kmaq Gi, the traditional and ancestral homeland of the Mi'kmaq people. And today I'm going to give an overview of how much of the information that's collected on research festivals such as Sahili is making its way into the management in Newfoundland and Labrador region from a, a more ecosystem perspective. Uh, so next slide. So it's really difficult to talk about Newfoundland and Labrador fisheries without discussing first um, the Atlantic cod or discussing Atlantic cod or the collapse of cod and other ground fish in the early 1990s. Uh, and so offshore fisheries in Newfoundland and Labrador shells have really been dominated historically by ground fish. And there's a huge historical and cultural significance to gr the ground fish fishery, even though currently the major fisheries have shifted to shellfish, um, particularly northern shrimp and snow crab. And however, there's a lot to be gained from learning from such ecosystem shifts. And although it may seem easy to point the finger at one or two causes, the reality is that uh, what has happened and what is happening and where things are going is pretty complex. Uh, and so focusing our efforts on single species management hasn't always been successful in developing sustainable fisheries. And so there's a strong impetus in the region to explore how we can use the breadth of ecosystem science to inform how we provide scientific advice to management. Next slide. 
So there have been a number of avenues, both internationally and more regionally, on explorations of ecosystem approaches to management that the Newfoundland and Labrador region are currently engaging with. And one is the International Council for the Exploration of the Seas Working Group on the Northwest Atlantic Regional Seas, uh, uh, which is focused on supporting integrated ecosystem assessments for the Northwest Atlantic region. And so this is a process with which management goals are identified and ecological indicators are developed to assess ecosystem status and health. Uh, and then we analyze uncertainty and risk and evaluate these strategies and, and implementation. Um, we also have uh, the North Atlantic uh, Fisheries Organization provides scientific advice for stock assessment in the North Atlantic. And we have a working group on ecosystem science assessment that has produced a roadmap for how ecosystem advice is incorporated into stock assessment. And so this is a more practical and tactical roadmap to understand how common species can be managed in shared waters. Uh, and nationally, there's been interest within Fisheries and Oceans Canada to explore how ecosystem approaches can better be incorporated into our stock assessment. So for example, incorporating climate change or food habits into single species stock assessment. Next slide. So one of the tools uh, that we're working with are ecosystem models. And there are a number of models developed for the region. And this includes uh, diet models, minimum realistic models, ecosystem production potential models. Uh, and I'm working specifically on ecosystem models based on our understanding of food webs and trophic interactions. And looking at how these models can work to fit into our current and future fisheries management. So in one study, we developed ecosystem models for the 1985 pre-cod collapse period and the 2013 shellfish dominated ecosystem. And uh, we explored how we can use ecosystem models to create boundaries around the variabilities of ecological indicators uh, that we use to evaluate ecosystem health and status. And what we've learned from this particular study is clearly there's not just one factor that is influencing the current ecology of the Newfoundland and Labrador shelves ecosystem. Um, and historical fishing practices have certainly played a role, but there's evidence that there's strong bottom-up control of the system. So things like ice dynamics and their influence on the diversity and abundance of key copepod prey, which Maxine pointed to in his presentation, um, uh, for, that's prey of forage species is really driving current system dynamics. Uh, next slide. And so what we're working on now is how we can tie all of this together with the human dimensions. Uh, and this has been a long-term uh, WGNARS project to develop a bioeconomic model for the grand and Banks region. And this work was incorporated into a large paper on how these types of socio-ecological models are developed and potentially used in management as an example of an integrated ecosystem assessment. And the development of this model continues as we get more experts involved in the project. Next slide. Uh, and at the regional level, ecosystem advice is being incorporated into stock assessment, for example, uh, snow crab uh, uses some environmental variables in their stock assessments and there are also ongoing discussions on how to use ecosystem level catch upper boundaries um, and ecosystem summary sheets for the Grand Banks ecological production units are being developed and many of these efforts are being replicated in other regions within Canada and that is the end of my presentation Thank you, Jamie. That was great. Um, if I could ask um, Maxime and the other Jamie, Jamie Palter, to turn uh, your cameras back on. Um, we've now got about 15 minutes um, for a little discussion among the panelists. And, um, and we're um, collecting questions that are coming in uh, from the audience. And, and we've got a few of our own lined up as well. Um, the one I'm going to start with, actually, is, a, is an audience question that came in um, while Jamie Palter was speaking, but I think it's one that is relevant to all our panelists. Uh, the question had to do with um, 
how the the patterns of connectivity and 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 current movements um, that you described um, over the tail of the Grand Banks um, can be estimated, and perhaps how they affect um, coastal areas and, and bays. Um, and I and I think that's um, there's a general question that I think is relevant to all panelists, which is you know we're talking about um, as we asked you to talk about. Um, processes, dynamics that are taking place, you know, offshore in the ocean, but perhaps not surprisingly, we all live on the coast and are maybe really interested to learn how um, both the, the physical processes and the ecological dynamics um, extend in and affect really near shore. Um, so Jamie Poulter, maybe I'll put that to you first since the question was originally directed at you, um, but um, I'd like to hear from Jamie Tam and Maxine as well. It's great to be on a multi-Jamie panel. Um, <laughs> so I, I think I can just uh, say that um, we, it was actually surprisingly simple once we keyed into the um, the fact that these currents are mostly geostrophic and they're observed from satellite altimetry to see the connectivity along the slope. So Afonso's paper tracked the anomaly along the slope in the surface geostrophic current. So, and then um, that's kind of where he left off and graduated and, and moved on to, to uh, you know, his next bigger and better things, or, well, <laughs> anyway. Um, and, and we do have a project funded now through NOAA to think about how those anomalies that propagate along the slope then get swept across the slope and onto the shelf and the time scales for that. And I think that's, in physical oceanography, that's, you know, like our very ripe, almost subdiscipline of its own to think about shelf slope exchange. Um, and so we'll see, we'll see where we go with that. Um, and then in terms of biogeochemistry, I can, you know, we can go that step further and say that if it's subtropical, it has um, high nutrients, low oxygen. Um, but then for the ecosystems, I'm not sure. Um, so that's, I, I would, you know, transition to, to the other speakers about how that influences the life on the seafloor and through the water column. Yeah, maybe we'll, uh, Jimmy Tam will want to add up on that after. But one way I see the connectivity between the inshore and the offshore uh, is not just in terms of, of currents, but really the animals move. Uh, so throughout yeah. their life cycle, they do move. So one really good example, I think a lot of people in, in Newfoundland could uh, rely to is Cape Land. So uh, Cape Land, part of the Cape Land population will go offshore to uh, spend the winter. And, and, for, and that's when the survey happens. Uh, but then they are exposed to uh, the cold temperature preventing there, and these are really affected by the, the processes. For instance, there are a layer is called a cold intermediate layer. That's the layer that is um, and ends up at depth uh, up down to 200, 400 meters where the, these fish are over the slope uh, during the rest of the year. But they are that is formed during the the winter time when the water uh, cools down at the surface and then descend, and then. What happens the, the rest of the year is that the fish will be exposed to this cold layer during the, most of their life cycle before coming back inshore. And so the temperature that prevails during winter time will have an impact, direct impact, uh, to which the, uh, these fish will be exposed part of their life cycle before they come back to land. And we know that uh, that could impact their, uh, their, their survival, uh, for instance. So there is a connection because the animal uh, moves. And I think that's one of the way we could see the connection, not just in terms of current being from a shore to inshore, but also because the animals move between these different regions and these different uh, water masses. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so so just to add that from like a like an ecosystem modeling standpoint, it's pretty not well kind of I guess like realized in the Newfoundland region to have kind of both offshore and inshore ecosystem models. Um, there are other types of models that 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 might be created that aren't necessarily connected between the two. Um, uh, so we are trying to do some work with the uh, Caitlin Group uh, at DFO uh, in Newfoundland, uh, connecting some of these larger ecological models and maybe perhaps downscaling them to be able to uh, explore Caitlin specifically and other forage fish. Um, but also um, our bioeconomic model for the Grand Banks also does include some inshore information. Uh, so we're still in the process of kind of collecting that and, and trying to figure out how we can kind of realize that part of it into the model. Um, so maybe that's not like a very concrete answer, but we're definitely thinking about it. <laughs> there just needs to be kind of more, more people 
more hands getting getting messy in, in that area. So. But, but Jamie, I think it's a good answer actually, and 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 Shayla um, has another question to put to you, but just. I, I want to try to synthesize a bit what I think I heard from all of you, which is that um, I think what Jamie Palter told us is that the cross shelf um, kind of physical processes are are reasonably well resolved or or becoming more so. Is that simplify, but but yeah, okay. Um, you know, Ma I think Maxine pointed out that of course you know the offshore and inshore areas are connected because the critters move. Um, and and so and I think Jamie, what we heard from you, Jamie Tam, is that okay? So now the ecosystem models need to catch up. They need to yeah. um, we need to better link then, given those physical um, and biological connections, the our, our ability to model both offshore and really nearshore areas in a more integrated way. Okay, right. Thanks. Uh, yeah, so we do have uh, another question from the audience. Um, so Maxime, Maxime, you mentioned that Cape Lynn and San Lance may be moving north, perhaps at the expense of Arctic cod, but the lanternfish don't seem to be extending the range as much. So are there any thoughts about why some Atlantic species seem to shift more easily than others? Um, and I'd also like to extend this to the other panelists as well. Um, is there anything in your research that you feel could help answer these questions? Yeah, so maybe I can, I can start on that quickly. Uh, I, and yes, that's that's the trend that we see is that there's a less abundance of, uh, or less trends toward less abundance of Arctic cod in some of these uh, uh, sentinel region of the Arctic, for instance, Hudson Bay and more uh, for uh, boreal species like Cape Land and Sandlands. I think there are two things that should be mentioned. So one is that again it's a little bit for the climatology so there's a trend but the reality is that it changes from one year to the other so you have here where you have uh, the distribution changes because the, the temperature is colder it's more it, it, uh, there's more ice there's uh, less ice so you have inter interannual changes too. so it's not a complete replacement and that's what i kind of foresee as well is that you will have uh, probably a less relative importance of arctic cod and more of the boil species but it will change from year to year also uh as to why some are not moving for the uh, lantern fish well it's really some species are better adapted to uh, the arctic ecosystem even if they are uh, from the south so capelin um do uh, it is a cold water species not an arctic species but we know it can survive in the arctic um another one that is a good candidate to expand its range in the arctic is uh, redfish uh, which is, has been shown to be able to, uh, to to survive at cold temperature Others will just not make it with the cold weather that is uh, that is there during during the uh, during the sun, uh, sorry during the winter. So that's the case of lantern fish. Um, we think that for the Canadian side, because it's it's really cold at the surface, because they need to come at the surface to food uh, to to feed, uh, they might not be able to sustain that this temperature for part of the year. And on top of that, as I mentioned in my my quick talk, uh, light might prevent them from uh, migrating further north. Um, there's a Sort of good models that show that because they conduct DV DVM, so dial vertical migration, feeding at the surface during nighttime and then resting at depth during daytime. If you are, for the for several months, if you have only daytime because it's a midnight sun, they will never come to the surface to feed, so they can starve to death. So that might be one uh, factor restricting them from uh, expanding their range network. So really, each species has their ecology, and it's not because you have the same similar environment. Uh, in, in the north now that is what or we're going toward a similar environment to what we have down south in the north that they will be able to adapt um, jamie tam in in the modeling and the ecosystem based approach that you work on um how do you account for these types of of um things right like the, the the sun or the lack of sun or is that how do you work all those into I don't, models? yeah i don't know if if it, the types of modeling that i do in terms of it, them being like the stick kind of static snapshot i mean 
those types of changes often can inform kind of the question and the simulation of that type of modeling um, that we're working at, but maybe not necessarily integrated into the model, um, which is, you know, kind of an interesting avenue to think about in general, like how do you incorporate um, those types of changes kind of that might happen spatial temporally into a model that they you want to then simulate and project into the future. Um, but really what we, we do for those types of changes is really just um, use it to inform the question um, and, and look at how that might change certain species and, and, and make little adjustments to those in our simulation and have a look at, at what might happen in terms of looking at potential trade-offs for management. Um, and, uh, oh, sorry, go ahead, Jay. No, no, go on, Shelley. I was going to say, uh, Jamie Poulter, in your work, have you had discussions with uh, people who work with Jamie or Maxime or other people in those areas about how maybe your research is interconnected and can support the work that they do? Um, I don't. I think this is the first time I'm meeting Jamie and Maxime. But um, mm -hmm. but we so the NOAA grant that we have has um, like an ecologist on it, and so, and Joe Langan, who is a great statistician, was a co-author on our paper, who has done, worked out a lot of the phenology stuff that I I just briefly mentioned. Um, and I guess one thing that's really striking is how um, difficult it is to have long time series which is super useful for, for investigating this stuff. And we're really lucky in Rhode Island, we have a long Narragansett Bay time series, which I didn't realize how unusual it is. It, it may, may be unique in the world for how long it is, but that's allowed him to, to tease apart a lot of these um, changes over time. And actually this, if, if it's okay for me to ask, I'm curious, um, maybe this is for Maxime, when you're looking at the DL vertical migration and those subsurface layers of fish that you see from the reflectance. Um, is it, do you get, is it useful to have information from a simple ADCP? Um, and just the context for this question, I know that that's just a bulk measure and it will just bounce off and have scattering, but um, we, Tom Rossby here at U URI has spent many of the last years of his life instrumenting merchant vessels with um, ADCPs. And so we have these like, twice weekly in some cases, uh, time series of, of velocities, but really we're getting scattering too. And so I've looked at it briefly. It, it's like an unfunded proposal that I say in the graveyard of good ideas where we've seen like um, the spatial distribution of these, these uh, subsurface scattering layers and how they vary in space, but, but potentially now we could look at how they vary in time. So that's a long winded way of saying it, would that be useful as a, biological marker for time series? Uh, the short answer is yes. I think it has been, uh, well, I know it has been used in many, uh, especially for more the DCP, it has been used a lot to show these DVM patterns, but even for all mounted, uh, and I'd say maybe the, the, the um, details, yes, in a qualitative way. So because these are not calibrated echo sounders, it's really hard to have any sense of abundance, uh, but it can still give you a relative changes in distribution, vertical distribution between regions and time of the day uh, and then years probably if you say you have you have long time series so i think it's uh as a data of opportunity i would say <laughs> it's a very good uh, uh, data set that could be used for for such questions so limited in to what you can push the analysis uh, but then definitely it could provide some good insight into the uh, the state of the ecosystem and how it changes so we're we're Drawing fast to the close of our time here, and as I feared it might, it went by much too quickly. Um, I want to ask one closing question that actually Jamie Poulter just just kind of got us started on. Um, uh, I, I was hoping we could we could sort of delve into the role of the North Atlantic as a globally significant carbon sink. I think there's a lot to explore there, tapping into all of your expertise, but I think we're going to have to save that for another day, unless. Unless that actually wants to inform your answer to this final question, which is which is generally, you know, as we look ahead, um, what would you say, um, briefly, succinctly, are some of um, you know the highest priority research needs, either you know within your field or in some of these um, interdisciplinary ways that that our discussion has been exploring? So, 
I'll leave that as an open-ended question for all of you to share some thoughts on, on our path forward. And, and why don't why don't we go uh, <laughs> why don't we go in the order uh, reverse order um, that we heard from you all? So we'll start with Jamie Tam, Maxime, and and Jamie Palter. You can close us out. Uh, well, I think from from my perspective, in my particular type of work, we're really working on kind of also looking at the interconnectedness between the science and um, e ecosystem valuation and how it impacts coastal communities and how we can do a better job of uh, really connecting the knowledge that we're gaining in terms of our fisheries and our environment and sustainability and conservation to uh, to coastal communities. And that's really involves like connecting more between like natural sciences and social sciences and, and developing that kind of multidisciplinary. And that includes like looking at how climate science and, and other types of sciences that we're exploring in this, this meeting and, and bringing that into kind of a social science perspective and, and seeing how that all connects together. Before Maxime goes, I'll just say I should have gone in the original order because Jamie, that would have been a perfect segue to our next <laughs> going to focus much more on on the human dimension. Um, yeah. we'll we'll remember those comments. Sorry, Maxime. Uh, I'd say I mean I think there are many questions that are left for uh, at least for Labrador Sea in that region that, as you know, is is a uh, very dynamic and uh, very important for the rest of the world's ocean, but. From my side, I think one of the questions, and it touches your first part of your question too, is trying to quantify what is the contribution to the biological carbon pump to that region and then how much is sequestrated. Uh, there are several components to that. One that we are interested in is uh, through these uh, DVM I mentioned, diet vertical migration. So tons of a lot of abundance from different species that spend part of their day at depth and go at the surface during daytime. And to really quantify that and how much carbon is exported through that, uh, I think it's still a, a question that needs to be addressed. And from other from other regions, uh, similar regions like Svalbard, we quantify that these could contribute as much as 30% of the uh, to the of the total biological carbon pump. So that's not uh, trivial. So I think it, it would be important to put uh, numbers on of that, and that would help also for our climate model uh, in the future. So I think this this is one of the standing questions that needs to be addressed. Uh, well, this is always, I guess, the big question is is what more we need to know. And I totally agree with Jamie that um, I don't know. We can. Put, I, I guess I get a little philosophical. Like, who gets to ask, ask that question? What what's important? And it's like so many people interact with the ocean. So I think finding ways to make our science as usable as possible, which doesn't mean we can't, you know, pursue these curiosity driven things. But figuring out where the, that intersection is 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 something I want to get better at too. Um, and so, um, yeah, I guess, but, uh, but understanding what to expect, I think providing predictability is something ocean scientists can help with, which then can help with uh, making decisions. And, it, and so that's where I think one place we can position ourselves is to provide extra predictability. And so whatever that means, um, whether it's through circulation or the ecosystem modeling and forecasting, I think is all really interesting. All right, well, unfortunately, that does bring our time to a close. Thank you very much to our panel, to Jamie, Jamie, and Maxime. Um, and we're now going to switch gears to uh, delve deeper into the human interactions with the ocean. So our first speaker in the next session is Fred Kingston, who is Executive Secretary of the Northwest Atlantic Fisheries Organization. In that role, he serves as the National Secretariat's Chief Administrative Officer, supervising and coordinating his activities and representing NAFO in external relations. Fred is a Canadian and a non-practicing lawyer, and prior to NAFO, he worked for the European Commission for over 25 years. Fred. Great, thank you. Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, thank you to the organizers for the opportunity to speak to you. Um, I'm going to go in my brief talk, basically say something about uh, what NAFO is, and then go into some of the issues that NAFO is addressing. Next slide, please. 
So NAFO is an international regional fisheries management organization, RFMO, in the UN Law of the Sea and UN Fish Stocks Agreement uh, framework. Uh, international cooperation in both fishery science and management it was established in 1979 um, after the declarations or during the time of the declarations of 200 mile limits of both Canada and the United States and uh, but it was a, a sort of a, it came from a predecessor organization called ICNAF, which was established in 1949. So there's been a fisheries organization managing the international fishery for 70 years or so. Uh, it manages the international waters of the Northwest Atlantic and four coastal states. Uh, next slide, please. Um, the objective, which is in the convention, um, to ensure the long-term conservation of fisheries resources, fairly traditional for a fisheries organization, but then as well, uh, a more holistic approach to fisheries management, which is the latter part to safeguard the marine ec ecosystems in which these resources are found. So much of my talk will be on uh, some of the things that we're doing uh, to, uh, um, to address this objective. Next slide, please. So this is a map of the convention area. Uh, the regulatory area is the darker blue uh, outside the 200 mile limits of uh, Greenland, Canada, US, a little bit of Bermuda and uh, Saint-Pierre-Miquelon, uh, France, just off Newfoundland. It's one of the few places where the continental shelf uh, extends beyond the 200 mile limits. And the NAFO fisheries take place mainly on this, this extension of the continental shelf, and it's mainly bottom trawling. And you can see the species there. Next slide, please. Uh, 13 contracting parties. Uh, we're a treaty-based organization uh, with the European Union. We represent almost 40 states, but uh, effectively only about 15 flag states actually fish in the area. Next slide, please. And this shows the interplay between our scientific council and our commission, which just makes decides the uh, management measures. So the major uh, meeting is in September, which is the annual meeting. So I was busy a few weeks ago. Um, and uh, it, it's based on the advice that comes throughout the year, but in particular with our main meeting of our scientific council, which takes place for two weeks at the beginning of June. Next slide, please. So I'm going to get into uh, some of the issues that we are addressing. And uh, this one is about the uh, how we're addressing the requirement that we apply an ecosystem approach framework to fisheries management. Um, I note that Jamie Tam had uh, referred to this roadmap in her previous presentation earlier today. Um, this is our ecosystem roadmap that has been um, developed over the last 15 years. Um, you can see on the right hand side the various tiers. Tier three is standard uh, uh, fisheries um, single stock assessment uh, and catch allocation. Tier two is the interplay between various species which is not that well developed so how does capelin as a prey fish um, fit with uh, fisheries from cod, et cetera? Or the interplay, for instance, in the Flemish cap between shrimp and redfish and cod. But I think what's, what is interesting is tier one, where um, uh, we're trying to put into practice, implement um, uh, issues such as ecosystem production units that were mentioned in Jamie's talk. Uh, total catch indices as a way of, of, of uh, providing guidance to managers in setting TACs or, or total allowable catch. And ecosystem summary sheets, which again will um, alert managers as to the state of the ecosystem. And finally at the bottom, identify benthic areas of special concern. This is where I'm going to go into uh, uh, vulnerable marine ecosystems. Next slide, please. So the protection of VMEs, um, uh, UN General Assembly, we've been doing this for the last few years or 15 years. The focus has been on indicator species, more on sponges, gorgonian corals and sea pens. Next slide, please. 
Um, we've done a number of measures to protect VMEs, and you can see, um, you know, we have a fishing footprint. We've, but the main thing is also we have closed areas uh, to uh, to bottom fishing in the NAFL regulatory area. Um, the next slide, please. And you'll see that up until now we have uh, 14 closed areas, uh, basically for sponges, sea pens, and corals. Plus, we've closed seamount areas, and um, the uh, the amount of the regulatory area is about a little over 10% of the regulatory area that has been closed. Uh, just a few weeks ago, um, NAFO agreed to close nine more VME VME closed areas, and had an additional seven seamounts closed to bottom fishing. So, uh, to be consistent, we closed all seamounts as a precautionary measure. To as a precautionary measure to all bottom fishings um, at fishable depth, which uh, for us was a depth less than 400 meters deep. Next slide, please. Another issue that uh, we have had to address is um, offshore oil and gas operations. Um, there's some activity that are taking place um, on the Canadian continental shelf beyond the 200 mile limit and obviously there's a potential for conflict with um, fishing activity and fisheries research and uh, as well um, sort of effects on the VME areas that we have closed. And how we've managed to address it so far is uh, having an it says propose, but it's actually in operation, an information exchange mechanism. So we share information with the Canadian authorities as to what our activity is and what the oil, potential oil and gas activity is, whether it's seismic activity or um, uh, drilling, uh, exploratory drilling, drilling at this point. Uh, next slide, please. Um, this is just uh, basically a uh, table of, of areas in which NAFO um, cooperates. Uh, NAFO is an intergovernmental organization. As you can see, much of this has to do with cooperation with various global and regional intergovernmental organizations. Um, next slide, please. And I will end my talk there. That's only a few of the issues that we're having to address but uh, thank you very much for your attention. I look forward to your questions. Thank you. And thank you, Fred. Uh, that, was a, that was just a great overview of the work of NAPO. And I, and I appreciate that you touched upon fisheries management, habitat management, interactions with other industries. That was, that was a nice overview, so thank you. Um, we're gonna bring Fred back, of course, for the panel discussion in a few moments. Um, but before uh, we do, we're gonna hear next from um, our next panelist, who is Robert Greenwood. Um, Robert is the director of the Leslie Harris Center of Regional Policy and Development at Memorial University and is also the university's associate VP for public engagement and external relations. Um, he led the development of Memorial's Cold Oceans and Arctic Science Technology and Society or COASTS initiative. That's a, that's a solid acronym right there. Um, which uh, helped shape the development of um, Memorial's Holyrood Marine Base, uh, established the Ocean Frontier Institute, um, and supported the university's partnership with the Nunavut Arctic College. So um, a lot of reach from that one initiative. So uh, recently, Rob led a workshop to inform Canada's federal blue economy consultations. And, um, and that's gonna be, um, I think, part of his remarks today. So we're looking forward to hearing more about the outcome of that process. So Rob, the floor is yours. Great, thanks very much and delighted to be with you. Uh, I uh, don't have the type of deep knowledge of oceans or fishery science that most of you folks would have, but the work I've done for over 17 years now with the Harris Center, uh, based in Newfoundland, Labrador at Memorial, the only university in our province, of course, is inextricably linked with everything to do with the ocean. Uh, and I'll talk, uh, well, maybe briefly, the Harris Center is uh, unique in the country and pretty rare in the world, we think, as a center that's all about knowledge mobilization, public engagement, specifically focused on the needs of Newfoundland and Labrador. And I report uh, through to the president's office uh, a, 
our work at the Harris Center relates to all our campuses, all our faculties. So there's loads of centers and institutes out there, as you know, but few have that kind of pan-university mandate to work with partners in community, in industry, in government, and NGOs. And so I get to uh, work with a lot of folks in a lot of sectors. And as, uh, as you mentioned, the COASTS initiative, Cold Oceans and Arctic Science, Technology, and Society, really tried to highlight the work that many units and faculty and staff at Memorial have done for decades. And we've never really bundled it together well across disciplines. And, uh, and so we uh, looked at the work of our Marine Institute, of course, and we've already had a presentation from one of our team there. Our engineering faculty is a leader in the world in ocean engineering and other uh, marine related areas. Uh, our Ocean Science Center, of course, you folks are very familiar with many of the researchers there. And uh, with oil and gas development, and also around the North Atlantic Rim, with our involvement in the Arctic, with indigenous people, and with our uh, original uh, European partners from the UK, uh, and then on to Norway, Greenland, Iceland, et cetera. So there's that whole network we draw upon. And so recently when DFO were doing their consultations on the blue economy uh, the strategy, they're developing as lead for the federal government. They reached out to me at the Harris Center and in my role with the Office of Public Engagement as well, and asked if we could pull together people from across the university, uh, humanities and social sciences, business, as well as other uh, the engineering and science and Marine Institute, et cetera. And we suggested with our work in the province, we collaborate all the time with all levels of government, including indigenous governments, uh, with NGOs, with uh, people in the private sector, um, and with our College of North Atlantic in Newfoundland, Labrador. And so we did just that on May 28th, 2021. We had over 100 leaders from the Fisheries Union, from industry associations, and all those other stakeholders I mentioned. We had a facilitated process and got people to report on the themes that DFO had identified as priorities in the Blue Economy Strategy. And very quickly, I know we only have five minutes, so I'll, I'll rattle through this fairly quickly, but happy to return to it in the Q&A if anybody wants. Uh, one of the areas, of course, obvious fit with this session on natural environment. And people argued we need to establish an ocean industry collaborative forum. And I think some of the questions we heard in the previous panel highlight the need to integrate across disciplines in science, but also then with social sciences, humanities, issues around governance, and then with stakeholders and participants from around the region. And that fits into the whole issue of breaking down silos, the need to support diversification and leverage ocean expertise to support Canada's energy transition. And the Harris Center, in fact, has a uh, an initiative called Forecast NL uh, on economy, society, and environment in Newfoundland and Labrador, and it's looking at climate change and uh, how those three areas must be addressed together if we're gonna have a successful transition. And I can talk more about that exercise if you like. Um, support the energy transition and then leverage expertise to support sustainable oceans. And we've heard a lot about that already. Uh, the second big area uh, DFO identified was science and data sharing. And the cross-section of folks we had talked about the need to share data to support collaboration. And again, right on the money with what you folks are all about. Support infrastructure and broadband improvements. And in many rural areas of Newfoundland and, uh, and many in Labrador, very basic access to broadband is, is limited or non-existent. Uh, form Indigenous Knowledge Partnerships which is something Memorial has placed a big emphasis on, like many universities across the country. Uh, we now have a vice president, Indigenous for Memorial. We have an indigenization strategy in Labrador. Our Labrador Institute has now established the School of Arctic and Subarctic Studies. And we are very active in the University of the Arctic and with our partnership with Nunavut Arctic College. Um, also, improved data 
being agile, innovative, and using the latest in technology and science. And again, you folks have demonstrated a lot of that. And the whole network that organized this session is a great example. I know our Marine Institute has been very active from the beginning in this area. And then foster international collaboration and projects like the Ocean Frontier Institute uh, and the Ocean Supercluster uh, really are all about connecting the great expertise we have in the region with people across the country and around the world. We, we don't want to reinvent the wheel, obviously. And most of these issues transcend uh, regions and countries. Uh, the third area, and the last one I'll mention in, in any detail, and then I'll skim across the rest, was innovation, uh, support innovative ecosystem development. And that re the innovation ecosystem is an area I study a lot, all about the, the jargon used is the quadruple helix on how innovation is all about post-secondary institutions, working with governments and industry and community. It's not about knowledge transfer from one to the other. It's about how they collaborate in the co-creation of knowledge and applying it in innovative systems. Uh, support the full innovation life cycle. There's a lot of money that goes into the front end in research, some in the whole accelerator area, but the commercialization area we're not very good at in Canada as a rule. Um, drive innovation with Canada serving as a catalyst customer. So the whole area of procurement used strategically. And then finally support the digital transformation of the blue economy. And that's a big area I know the ocean supercluster has put a lot of money into. It's where the whole ocean uh, monitoring work is all about. And as we look at our issues in socioeconomic in our province, across rural Canada, and indeed increasingly around all the OECD countries, uh, demographic challenges are more and more the reality. Uh, the boomers are aging. We've had a lot of rural to urban migration. Fertility rates have dropped through the floor. And so we have to become better at doing more with less. And that is especially the case in remote activities on the ocean in uh, the various sectors. And so a lot of work in that area. The other big categories I can go into more if someone wants related to finance, uh, market access, business environment, regulation, and telling our ocean story. And I think I may be near the end of my time. I'll maybe take 30 seconds or so. Uh, that really is what our Coast Initiative was about. We have loads of amazing people at Memorial doing loads of great work in partnership with colleagues around the country and the world. But most of these people are really busy doing it and not spending enough time talking about it, especially outside their scientific circles. And we know as a society, we're all facing challenges of getting evidence-informed decision-making. Often it seems to be evidence-free decision-making. And in my experience lately, we see a lot of evidence-defiant decision-making. Well, the real area that I spend a lot of my time on, and Memorial has a, a public, an office of public engagement, we have a uh, public engagement framework approved by the Senate, the university academic governing body. We're the only university in the country with that. It's partly because of our status as the only university here, our special obligation to the people of the province. And so public engagement is a way of doing teaching and learning, a way of doing research. It's not something separate. It's not PR, it's not communications. And I'd love to talk more about that if we have time. I think I'm probably at the end of my time and happy to turn it back to our moderator and uh, look forward to more conversation. Thank you. Thanks so much for that excellent talk, Rob. And you're right that you really, what your, your work does really touches on a lot about what we're trying to do here and what we're trying to bring into these discussions. So we're very happy to have you here and very much look forward to your comments during the panel discussion. Thanks. Um, our final speaker on this panel is John Farrell, who is the Executive Director of the U.S. Arctic Research Commission. John was aboard Healy for the Northwest Passage Transit that Larry described earlier, and he provided Larry with those stunning photos that uh, he shared in his presentation. Uh, because this webinar series aims to explore issues and connections at large scales in the Northwest Atlantic, we did ask John to join us and to offer his perspectives on how scientific, policy and economic activities in subpolar waters 
affect the direction of an Arctic oriented agency like his. John, take it away. Thank you very much. I'll speak for five minutes on the topic. Uh, so I will be talking about how the Northwest Atlantic is a gateway to the Arctic. I'll talk specifically about the kind, some of the changes we're seeing in the Northwest Atlantic because of climate and Arctic change. I'll talk about new opportunities in the changing ocean. I'll talk about economics. And I'll talk a little bit about federal US policy. Next slide, please. Some of the impacts of climate change uh, uh, on the Northwest Atlantic region include warming surface temperatures, as has been discussed, uh, identification of new species in the area that haven't been seen previously. There's been impacts on lobsters that affect both the larval stages and the, and the adults. There's also the resurgence of lobster shell disease. Uh, ocean acidification is making an impact in the, in the Northwest Atlantic area. And rising sea levels affect not only that region, but, uh, but globally, but specifically storms and high tides that floods docks and piers and low-lying streets and waterfront property owners are having trouble uh, getting homeowners insurance in the area. So these are some of the, the impacts. Next slide, please. So because of these changes, there's, there's opportunities as well. And as the quote here from the former chief of naval operations, basically calls the Arctic as the fifth ocean, and that's really opening up now. By that, he meant less ice, uh, more access because of, of, of climate change and because of increases in technology. Uh, and that access will provide uh, uh, the ability to go after resources, including fish stocks, as has been discussed, new trade routes. Uh, there will be energy and minerals that will be more accessible. Uh, so the Arctic is a, a research rich area and the Northwest Atlantic is a gateway to that area. There's also an increase in shipping and tourism uh, as the Arctic grows more accessible uh, due to less ice and technological advances. Next slide, please. Uh, with regard to economics, uh, uh, Maine, as an example of an area in the Northwest Atlantic, defines itself as an Ama American trading portal for the Arctic. It's connected to the Icelandic IMSKIP Arctic Navigation Network and the Royal Arctic Line in Greenland. Uh, also in the Northwest Atlantic, you have Boston, which has a sales office for the Royal Greenland, uh, which is a fish company. And the U.S. has opened a consulate in Greenland for the first time in a long, long time. Um, related to what's going on in Portland, uh, there will be a new storage facility, a cold storage facility in Portland that will begin uh, groundbreaking in 2021. And uh, it's also important to notice how, how much uh, Arctic cruising tourism has increased over the past decade. It's really rather an explosive industry. Uh, next slide, please. With, this is my last slide, and with regard to federal Arctic policy impacts in the Northwest Arctic uh, Atlantic region, excuse me, one of the things that the nation, uh, that this administration is focusing on is a national strategy for the Arctic region. It was originally published in 2013, and the White House has led through the National Security Council is updating that strategy, and it focuses on security, stewardship, and international cooperation. The White House also recently announced the reactivation of an interagency committee called the Arctic Executive Steering Committee, which provides guidance to agencies and enhances coordination across uh, agencies. And uh, that too was created by an executive order originally in the Obama administration. It was rather dormant during the Trump administration, but it's being reactivated by the Biden administration. So that'll help give a focus to the area and obviously, again, connections back to the Northwest Atlantic region. Uh, finally, federal policy um, has also um, put, been focusing a lot on scientific research, Arctic research in particular. Uh, the White House, at the same time that it reactivated the Arctic Executive Steering Committee, it appointed new commissioners to the Arctic Research Commission. And Larry uh, Mayer, a previous speaker, is a former commissioner uh, on the Arctic Research Commission. And we connect with a variety of groups, including the New England Arctic Network. Uh, and finally, at the federal level, there are, on the congressional side of the House, there are Senate Arctic, there is a Senate Arctic Caucus. There's actually a House Arctic Caucus as well, and includes, for example, Senator Murkowski from Alaska, but also Senator Angus King from Maine. 
So these are four areas where federal Arctic policy is impacting the Northwest Atlantic. And my time is up at seven at five minutes. Thank you very much. John, thank you um, for those remarks. Um, I, I really appreciate you joining us, and I and I think um, your um, your involvement and and your comments kind of underscore one of the major themes across this whole series, which is that while we are moving through a series of distinct geographies across the Northwest Atlantic, it really is a larger interconnected region. Um, and, your, and your comments actually took us from sort of the subpolar waters we're focused on today, um, of course, up to the Arctic where your agency focuses, but also right down to um, the region we'll talk about in a couple weeks uh, down here in the Gulf of Maine and Scotian Shelf. So, so thank you for those um, those comments. Um, John, keep your camera on if you don't mind, and I'd like to ask uh, Fred and Rob to turn theirs back on so we can have a bit of a panel discussion. Um, there's Fred and there's Rob. Great, thanks for um, sticking around uh, to you and for everyone else who's still with us. Um, we've got about 15 minutes left, and we can use most of that time for this panel discussion. We don't need a lot of time to wrap this up. The main thing we're going to do um, is remind everyone that we're having our final webinar in two weeks, um, and we really hope you'll all come back and join us. Uh, so we'll remind you that again at the end, but I'll plant that seed right now. Um, so to kick off our panel discussion, um, I want to um, ask a question um, about a topic that Rob you've already touched upon but you know Jamie Tam in introducing herself earlier acknowledged that she was coming to us from the um, ancestral lands of the Mi'kmaq people. Um, I myself am sitting on the ancestral lands of the Penacook band of the Aben of the Wabanaki people. Um, we really really had hoped to um, include a member of an indigenous community on this panel. Um, unfortunately, um, a surprising number of schedules were just, uh, calendars were just not cooperative. Um, but um, I, I kind of want to take the opportunity to ask all of you um, for any experiences, initiatives, partnerships that your institutions have had with Indigenous peoples or um, opportunities you see to strengthen partnerships along those lines. So. Um, Rob, like I said, already touched on this, and Rob will invite you to expand on that in a moment if you'd like. But um, uh, maybe Fred and then John, if you'd like to share any any experiences or insights there, we'd, we'd love to hear from you. Um, <laughs> thank you. Um, I'm not sure I have much to say. Um, the um, NAFO is an intergovernmental organization, so uh, we interact with states, basically, our, our contracting party states. Um, there may be um, some, and we um, operate beyond the 200 mile limits, so on the really on the international waters in the high seas. So it's quite a long way from the coast, obviously. Um, there may be uh, some Aboriginal um, delegates within the Canadian and the Greenland um, uh, Greenland delegations to to various meetings, and their input would be to their respective head of delegation, uh, Canada or um, Greenland. We also have a, an observer a band council from the Innu Nation of Nutashkwan, uh, which is an accredited observer of NAFO. Um, I think there is um, um, uh, an Innu or an Inuit um, uh, industry that is, had, w is thinking of having a long um, and offshore uh, fisheries, and so there's some interest in possibly um, NAFO quotas, et cetera. But that's all for me. Thanks. John, would you like to weigh in on this one? Sure. Uh, in my work in Arctic research, we have been intimately engaged with indigenous peoples in the Arctic region who have extensive rights in the region and with whom uh, there is continuous engagement. There's always efforts to do it better, of course, specifically in the Arctic Research Commission and by law, we have had one person who represents the indigenous peoples of the Arctic region on the commission. We currently have two on the commission. Uh, and within the research world, there's a big push and effort to uh, improve co-production of knowledge in terms of research 
and to work together uh, in better uh, ways over time. Thanks. Um, and, and Rob, uh, you, you, you touched on this question a few times in your remarks, but if there's anything you want to um, expand upon, we'd... Um... Sure, I can add a bit. And I think the whole point I was making about public engagement being the way you do research, the way you do teaching and learning, it's not about doing it and then transferring out and sharing, which is really important and we have to do a good job of that but it's about collaborating in the exercise. And as uh, John mentioned, co-creation is a key word there. There have been many examples of researchers over the years going into indigenous communities and other communities and doing research, taking the data, going away, publishing, and the community never hears from them again. And so the Inuit communities across Canada have become very effective with a research policy that uh, talks about procedures and values and ways to work with those communities. Uh, many of our organizations, certainly universities, as I mentioned, we have an uh, Office of Indigenous Affairs and a VP responsible. We now have a VP uh, Research Indigenous. So these are people who have expertise in this area and personal connections, obviously. A lot of it is about social capital. And I think all researchers need to be able to harness these types of expertise and build the relationships. And it takes time. Uh, the Harris Center has been around for 17 years and we've done many, many projects in Labrador, collaborate with Nazi of it, uh, the Inuit territory in Northern Labrador and as a government. And they're really well organized. And in fact, I would highlight that a lot of my own work is with rural Canada and around the North Atlantic Rim and many rural communities, non-Indigenous, lack adequate resources these days. And indeed, with the uh, success of many Indigenous communities now with self-governance, they can become a resource for other communities uh, in their regions. And that's certainly the case in Labrador. So uh, there's lots of detailed uh, best practices. And like everything, it's all about us sharing and connecting and happy to follow up with anybody as a way to connect them with people who know more than I do uh, after this session. All right, thanks everyone. Um, and I'd like to kind of follow up on this discussion with a slightly broader scope. Um, you know, we've, we've heard a lot today um, and there's a huge scale of our region of interest, both latitudinally and outward across the North Atlantic. So it really seems that we need all hands on deck to meet the variety of needs that we've discussed here and, and more. Um, so, you know, we just discussed involving, you know, the importance of involving our Indigenous organizations and communities, but I just wanted to, to broaden that a little bit um, and ask about any promising collaborations you've had um, with other organizations, particularly with the private sector, and any thoughts you have on how all of these different sectors can work together? Um, John, maybe we'll start with you this time. Well, in uh, my world, there's a number of private-public partnerships, P3 efforts that uh, I've seen, some of them in marine transportation, uh, some of them in uh, resource development. I can't say that I'm deeply versed in any of them, uh, but those would be so, a, a couple examples in transportation and resource development, uh, particularly the mining sector, uh, where we have the equivalent of a crown corporation in the US, uh, the DFC uh, development, um, uh, Jesus, what is it, development, I forget. This is basically like a crown corporation where they try to help invest to get uh, the private sector involved. Uh, and that's where research also comes in. Uh, Rob? Yeah, that's an area I've spent a lot of time over the years uh, in the ocean area and blue economy. As I mentioned, when we did the blue economy consultation, it was a natural not to do it just as the university because we know across our faculties and units and campuses, it is in partnership 
with governments, with industry, with NGOs, with social enterprise, uh, where the action happens. Uh, we actually partnered with the Monk Center at U of T Innovation Policy Lab a few years ago, and they did studies of our Marine Institute and CCOR because they are set up, CCOR is a separately incorporated entity of Memorial, wholly owned by the university, but with a fiduciary board. And their job is to bring science and engineering to industry in, and they do work now with the European Space Agency, with Boeing, they've worked with all the oil companies, but they also collaborate with students and faculty. Um, but having mechanisms and procedures and people whose job description is to be the connector, the broker. Uh, I often say I'm a, a salesman with a PhD. Um, I publish a little bit, but that's not what I'm employed to do. And, and so having that kind of knowledge mobilization, public engagement unit, uh, policies, procedures, every university is wrestling with this now, and many do it better than others. Uh, but also building the relationships again. So we have a really close relationship with industry associations. In uh, Newfoundland and Labrador, we have NOIA, the Ocean Industry Association, which mainly oil and gas. There's a new one called Econext, which used to be the Newfoundland Environmental Industry Association. We have Tech NL, Aquaculture Industry, Fishery, et cetera, et cetera. And they have many, many members at the firm level. And so it's developing the relationships with the brokers and then you can match make at the detail level and maybe a final point we developed at the harris center years ago a tool called yaffle y-a-f-f-l-e you can go on and google that it's in the dictionary of newfoundland english as we all know newfoundland and labrador has a, a unique dialect and at memorial we developed our uh, dictionary years ago most of the words are related to the fishery and our, our history in the fishery uh, yaffle is a yaffle of fish. All the dried salt cod you could carry was a yaffle. And so we have a yaffle of research and expertise. And you can go on yaffle and plug in keywords, blue mussels, and find out who at Memorial is doing work in that area, pull up lay summaries of that work, find out who those researchers are partnering with. And so it facilitates private sector, NGO, government, media, finding faculty, and vice versa. So you got to be focused on it. Don't reinvent the wheel and good things happen. That's really interesting. Thanks, Rob. And I certainly didn't know that uh, that existed. And I think that's a really valuable tool for anyone looking to uh, find someone to connect with in a certain area. Um, and Fred. Uh, uh, yes. Um, actually, for us, that's an interesting question. Um, uh the cooperation of one of my slides was more uh intergovernmental to inter intergovernmental so between international organizations um however um there is a concern within our nafo contracting parties about uh the impact or the potential impact of other activities going on in the uh regulatory area the area that's fished on fisheries. I touched on oil and gas, but there's all sorts of other aspects, marine transport, um, other fisheries we don't regulate. So for instance, the tuna fishery, um, um, you know, uh, cables, uh, telephone cables, um, pollution from ships, um, defense activities, etc. So that's one of the areas in which there's, um, and seabed mining, of course, one of the areas in which we um, um, don't have really the expertise and we really have to reach out to, to others for the expertise. Um, I should note in this, so there's been a, an effort uh, in the last several years to reach out particularly to the International Seabed Authority, the Convention on Biological Diversity, et cetera. So some of these organizations that are doing it as well as um, coastal states that may be involved in such activity. Um, there's also the process going on in the UN. There's a negotiation uh, for a multilateral or plurilateral treaty within the UN um, Convention on the Law of the Sea. This is to protect biodiversity beyond national jurisdiction or to use the terminology BBNJ. Um, the issue there, 
is, well, the architecture to protect many marine genetic resources, marine protected areas and other closed areas, uh, environmental assessments, et cetera. The idea is to protect biodiversity and how that works um, and how that affects um, organizations such as ourselves and the more global organizations such as the um, IMO, um, et cetera, the ISA, um, all sort of UN um, organizations. So um, that's, that's an area where we've also tried to reach out. And obviously there's a need and there's recognized need for coordination, but how that will fall out, I don't know. Um, in terms of just in general, private sector will be part of, um, particularly the fisheries industry will be part of our contracting parties delegations. Each contracting party will have members of their fishery industry as well. And we have observers on that. So that's just a very broad, brush, but it's an issue that um, uh, since we're a sectoral organization, uh, we have to try and reach out more broadly um, just to ensure uh, that our interests are known and that uh, uh, known to the others and that hopefully this collaboration won't uh, affect our operations too badly in the future. Thanks. Thank you, Fred um, and John and Rob. Um, we're, we're just past the top of the hour. And as we discovered two weeks ago, and I'm sure we're going to discover again two weeks from now, this time goes by very quickly, um, especially with the both geographic breadth and breadth of issues we're trying to tackle here. Um, but I do want to be respectful of your time. You've all been very generous in um, in making time to join us tonight, today, and and share your insights. So, um, but we should close out um, and let everyone get back to um, everything else you need to be doing. Um, before we do, though, I mean, I, I really just want to say a big thank you to, and I'm gonna make sure I get everyone here to Lyra, Keith, Carl, Larry, Jamie, Maxine, Jamie, uh, Fred, Rob, and John. Um, again, your time, your thoughtfulness has been really appreciated. Um, and um, we're we're hoping this is just the beginning of a discussion um, that will continue on through different forums. Um, we're going to capture a lot of what we covered here today in a summary report that will be disseminated after we complete the series. Um, but Shayla, all right. I just want to echo Jake's thanks to all of our, our speakers today. Um, you really helped make this series interesting and informative, and bring up a lot of great points that I hope will continue to inform discussions in the future. Um, and, and just as we close out, I want to remind everyone that we do have one more webinar to go in this series. So in two weeks on October 20th, we'll turn our attention to the area where Seas Atlantic and Naracruz uh, most closely operate the Gulf of Maine and the Scotian Shelf. Uh, so thank you all for joining us today. Please do register for our third and final program and spread the word. And I hope we'll see you all on the 20th.